Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 273 for Monday, no, Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. And welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by four and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. I love it every time you say it, my friend. I mean, I love, I love he- saying it every time. That's good. I like talking to you too. That like that, I like that even better. But you know, the, the <laughs> I, I do like hearing Napomo. It's good. It's good. Somebody's got. Hey, how dude, has you that s- not been put in a song lyric that I know about? I don't know. I don't know. I heard the other day it was on a, it was an answer to a Jeopardy question as to where the best weather in the United States are is Napomo, California. Okay, so I have other words that I want to say to you now that that have an even better like 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 feel in my soul, not no, so much a mouthfeel, but we don't say those on the show. So I'm not going to say them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't usually hey, man, you, say them on the show. Let me put it that way. Yeah. We try, we, we generally avoid those. So you know. I hear you. Um, you see, you brought something up out of the past last week that uh, got me, got me reading. So you brought up that crazy Bob left sets letter. The, oh yeah. Uh, the left sets letter. Yeah. 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 Did, did you put that in the show notes? I'm sure I did, but I'll put it in again. Yeah. So, man, you know, I remember I, I had to come to my email box every day, you know, for years. And he's just a weird guy. Like, I don't know what he looks like. I don't know how old he is. But, you know, his, his daily letters are these crazy stream of consciousness things. He seems a little bit like a, you know, get off my grass, get off my lawn type of guy. And a little bit of like sage advice about how the music industry works today. If you want to be successful, he he supports and contradicts himself in the same letter yes. often. Yes. It's, it's a really bizarre read, isn't it? It is. So, so Bob is, I believe he's an attorney by, by training and worked for like five minutes as a, an attorney in the entertainment business. Right. And, and then became sort of a consultant to major record labels. I'm, I know I'm skipping things in the middle because I don't know the guy's whole career, but, but I know that like he, I, he grew up in the, in the Northeast. He grew up not, not too far from where I grew up, but he grew up down in, uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut, and then attended college in Vermont at Middlebury, uh, which he talks about in his letter all the time. And then, you know, moved out to LA and, and that's where he, you know, that's where he still lives. So, I always appreciate the the fact that either on his podcast or in his letter, he's always talking about, you know, he, not always, but occasionally we'll refer back to, you know, the vibe of like Fairfield County, which is the the area of Connecticut that's sort of borders yeah. right up against New York there, which is where I grew up. So, so like, I like that, you know, that, 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 you know, Hey, I know a thing, right. You know, that sounds familiar to me. So we all like that kind of stuff, but, but really what I like is his, um, his, 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 perspective on and access to the music industry. And he is more than happy to name drop all the time, mm, all yeah. the time, you know, and, and and like I always say, and and if he hears this, which I'm guessing he won't, but if he does, he, he might either laugh or hate me or, or more likely both at the same time. You know, Bob left sets is very much concerned with Bob left sets. And, <laughs> and, he, and especially he's concerned with, the right view on something being Bob left sets his view on something. So that like you have to go into, like you said, you, you know, you read his letter and it's like, wait, you just contradicted yourself four different times. And yet you're, you're always convinced you're right. Like, how is this even possible? And it's well, just, if you, if, he, if one of those four things was right, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But he does have like, he does have a, he seems to have a good, like he knows this about himself. He's has some self-awareness like that. that it's just how he is. Yeah. He's, he is 67, uh, to answer your question, uh, mm-hmm. and he looks like a a balding... 67-year-old uh, Jew- lawyer, right? Yeah, 67-year-old lawyer. I was going to say a balding 67-year-old Jewish lawyer, and that's only because I grew up around balding 67-year-old yeah. Jewish lawyers. But, I mean, like that, you know, I don't I don't mean that any way other than no, to no, be no. descriptive. I, yeah. That's a very apt stereotype for someone to get a picture in their mind. Mm. Um, you know, I, I will say he genuinely seems like someone that rock and roll music did something to him amazingly positive and he has a heart for it. And, you know, I think he a bit pines for the old days, like I said before, but he also is like, you know, cold medicine for 
people who pine for the old days to understand exactly how it works now. Yeah, it's not he's coming back. Bitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a little bitter about how it works now, but he's, he's, he realistically will present how the music industry works right now. But he, um, he predicted the death of compact discs accurately uh, when everybody thought he was crazy. He predicted the sort of, I, I would think because of the same line of thinking, he predicted the, 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 like the rise of peer to peer, you know, like Napster file sharing things mm. as that happened. So because of that, and I think also just because of his, his, his technology preferences, he very much also like keeps his fingers in the Apple world too. Uh, when that makes sense, but, but, you know, like he'll talk about WWDC keynotes from, you know, that Apple does, uh, that have nothing specifically to do with the music business, even though Apple's more and more in the entertainment business now, but he likes Apple tech, but he also likes, you know, Apple's positions in the entertainment industry too. I mean, they, you know, they took Napster, the Napster concept, and they were the first to actually legitimize that and make it so that, you know, people were buying songs online instead of just stealing them and all of that. So, yeah. so yeah, but he, you know, he's, he's got a really interesting view and mostly an accurate view on things, even if it's not what you want to hear, like his views on, I think I brought it up last week because he was talking to Tom Marshall on Tom Marshall's podcast. Tom's the, uh, among other things, the longtime lyricist for the band Fish. And uh, he was talking to Tom about, you know, um, uh, uh, Spotify, but also Ticketmaster and kind of how that works. And he's like, you know, you shouldn't be hating Ticketmaster. And he he went into explaining why, which was very interesting. He says, you know, that the reason they add all those fees on is because that's the only place Ticketmaster makes a profit. They make almost nothing off of ticket sales. A hundred percent of the ticket sales go to the artist. And then you've got house fees and, and, you know, all that stuff. So it's just yeah. an interesting, it, yeah, he, he, he has, yeah, I like, I, I most, I don't read every issue of the left sets letter that comes in. I look at the, the titles and occasionally, yeah. you know, it's like, if this interests me, I'll read the first paragraph or two, like you, stream of consciousness is the best way to describe it. He, he, in fact, he has been, I have heard him say he doesn't reread anything he's written before he published. It reads like that. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> He doesn't huh. write terribly, though. I mean, like knowing that this is a rough no, he's draft. A, he's he's a smart guy. Yeah. It's just that the emotions and contradictions kind of float <laughs> to the top. Totally. Very, you know, very cleanly. He he wrote a, a thing about Springsteen on Broadway, mm. and he's kind of pining pining away for the artist that Bruce was, and and he kind of likes the format that large rock stars should get in closer with their audiences way, but he did it and he totally sold out by going straight to, you know, uh, telling, doing it in a way that would resonate with his fans as though that's a bad thing. Right. So it, it, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, he will uh, pick fun a, at everyone, like not pick fun, but he will, he, no one, pick is, at anyone. no one is yeah, off they, limits. If he thinks somebody's not doing something exactly the best way, he will, he will. But something. in that is actually his best stuff because Correct. it's not off limits, but he will give you a little peek in the kimono about that. There is reverence for some of the, for some of the, some of the success stories, some of the, you know, music idols. He loves music. And I think that's, that actually is what comes to, he loves music, but he kind of comes off as a get off my lawn type of guy. He's totally a curmudgeon. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he would, right. I'm sure he would describe himself that way. And in fact, I, I say that because I can't pinpoint a specific time when he did, but I'm certain that he has already. So yeah. 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 But anyway, he, it's, it is a fun read, but it's just a weird read. I, the, 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 the ones that I do like are when he, and I think I mentioned this last week, so sorry for rehashing, but when he writes something, you know, he gets emails back from his subscribers, you know, responses. And he will occasionally, if something gets a lot of response and he feels it might be entertaining to share those responses, he'll just put together a, a you know, an entire email full of, I don't know, sometimes 20, 25, 30 different responses, depending on how long yeah. they are. But the cool part is, you know, those often read as a who's who. And, and there are, I mean, I've, I've had some responses in there, so I don't mean that as a who's who I mean, like, no, like, like Elton musicians John who you would know, yeah, Joe yeah. Walsh, but also like the people that, that you don't necessarily know that, you know, the, the, the person that played with so-and-so here or produced this record, whose name maybe didn't come up, you know, like those kinds of things. And those people also have their perspective and he, 
you know, he he curates that so that you you do get this behind the scenes look that even Bob didn't have. And of course, this is how Bob builds up his his perspective of the industry is by just listening and being around these people. It's amazing. I He won't talk about how many subscribers he has, because as he says, everybody in the industry lies and I tell the truth. So if I tell you the truth, you're going to think that I just took my number and increased it by five X. <laughs> He's like, so I'm just not going to tell you the number. It's like, that's fair. <laughs> You know, yep. <laughs> so anyway, good read. It's definitely something people who listen to us would probably get a kick out of just for a perspective. Yes. Cause it kind of ties together, you know, that people have worked hard to, to become stars. You know, he kind of, yeah, that's one of the things he reveres is like the, the path to stardom, at least the path to stardom as it used to be. Um, and he makes a distinction between that and, you know, the path to stardom now and the, you know, the types of talent that goes into stardom. It, it's, it is, it's a, it's a fascinating read and you're right. You can usually just scan the, the uh, subject of the email and decide if you want to read today's. It, yeah. Letter. Does this, does this do it for you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's good. He the the stuff comes out on email first. He delays it appearing on his website by I think three or four days because he wants people to subscribe to his letter. You know, okay, like he's he's not an idiot. Like he he understands the value of email marketing. You know, and yeah, yeah he wants to own his audience. So yeah, it's fine. But no doubt. Yeah, it's good. Hey man, I played uh, I played three sold out shows this weekend. You are a working musician, man. You are back in the game. Well, I, I like, like, let's make it very clear. I played three sold out shows this weekend. I, I don't have anything else on the books <laughs> because, you know, it's about to be October and it gets cold here. And so these opportunities are, are, are few and far between, but yeah, it was. And then Thursday, it was interesting. Thursday, we went out to dinner uh, in, it was my birthday and we went to dinner in Portsmouth at, at this one place and then played a gig in Portsmouth on Friday and played two other gigs in Portsmouth on Saturday. All three of these locations were within about a half a block of each other. It was really fascinating. Mm. Yeah. But, um, Friday was a, an outdoor one-off performance of Hedwig, which was, it was interesting. I mean, it was, it was fun to do it again. It was fun to play with, you know, those, those guys again. I, I, I enjoy playing with that band. Um, it was weird doing it outside, but it was especially weird doing it as a one-off show. We didn't rehearse it at all. We just got, we, we treated it like a rock gig. We got there, we set up, we played it, we went home. Um, so it, there was no, like the, the normal flow to like a, a three night weekend run or even a two night weekend run just didn't happen. You know, it was just like a pickup big gig, but it, it was all the same people, you know, um, but it was interesting. And of course, Hedwig is a, a weird show with even weirder subject matter. And so, and, and then lots of like glam rock and punk rock uh, music. And so the people that were, you know, dining at outdoor dining at the restaurants sort of along the street next to where we did Hedwig, I have no idea what went through their minds as they, as they sort of in, began figuring out that there was this story about a botched sex change operation being displayed on stage next to them. But you know, that's fine. Would have been interesting, but yeah. So we, we did that. I had, we had we had some issues that night. Um, the 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 first issue was it right in the first song. Uh, I suddenly found that I had no idea where I was, and my hands were not capable of playing the drums. Uh, second verse of the first song. It was just one of those moments. I I guess I was thinking about a lot of different things, which I'm totally used to doing. Right? If anybody that listens to the show knows, like I can have six things going on and worried about the sound and doing this. But, you know, just playing a 2-4 groove usually doesn't, like, fall off the rails. <laughs> and suddenly I realized, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I got to pay more attention. And it was like, wait a minute, no, I need to stop and reset and start playing again. And and uh, our bass player kind of looked at me and gave me a laugh. And it was like, yeah, I don't know. And my daughter, <laughs> my daughter was there. And at the end of the night, she was like... Did you break a stick? What was that? I'm like, yeah, you know, I could come up with a, a long list of potential <laughs> excuses, but I don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, Just asleep at the wheel. I was totally asleep at the wheel. It was like, thank goodness the band didn't stop. Right. Y you know, like they just, they, they did what they were supposed to do. They just kept playing and I, I caught up with them and, and that was that. But I, like, I, I cannot remember that ever happening before. So that was an interesting little little thing. It was like, huh? So I don't know what it was that distracted me, but it certainly was, um, 
certainly was an interesting, it was, a, you know, it was like, oh, heads up, alert, you know, yeah, you know this song, but doesn't mean you ha- can stop paying attention. Like, keep playing, man. Like, let's keep, yeah. <laughs> keep things going. <laughs> That's a brutal thing. And, once, and then sometimes when that happens and then you realize it, sometimes then you go into the brain and the brain is a bad place to go to yeah. sort these things out, right? No, but, you can't. That that's right. Yeah, thankfully I only it was only maybe a 5 second thing. Uh but that's a long time. Yes it is. <laughs> Especially for the drummer to like be just off the rails. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's weird. But thankfully it, happens. it it I guess it does. I like I said I I don't recall it ever happening. I'm sure it might have uh but um, but I hope it doesn't happen again. That was, you know, that was the thing. It was like, I was, and I was pissed after it happened. Cause I knew like whatever I did, uh, did not get committed to short-term memory. Like I can't tell you the four other things that I was focusing on or thinking about or whatever it was, but something caught my eye or my attention in a way that was not productive for the scenario. But I feel like I've been doing this a long time. Like I, I, I wish I knew what it was so that I could, you know, train myself not to let that happen again, but alas, it, it is elusive. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting and it was, you know, just one of those things. It was like, Hey, we, um, COVID brain. yeah, co- yeah, exactly. Let's hope not, man. Um, we, um, we had the, the, that outdoor stage. I've, I've done one other gig there and it's all run from a, a monster generator. I mean, I think it's like a hundred kilowatt generator or something like that. Like, you know, n- no issue with the amount of power that it has, but we were, I'll say, let's say two thirds of the way sh- through the show and, uh, the power cut out. It's like, okay, we'll stop, you know, got to stop playing. The only thing you're going to hear is drums and not through the, not through the mains. So I was like, okay. And sound guy, great engineer. Yeah, I've worked with him. Actually, we had two engineers on the gig and I've worked with them both many times in the past, really like top notch guys and, and top notch staff. And so it was like, okay, let them get it back up and running. They did. We started the song again. It, it Four times the power cut out in this tune. And finally, after the fourth one, we kind of start, okay, what's causing this? And it was a, a ground fault trip where it was, you know, something was tripping the ground. Now it it's getting colder and at night, you know, the temperature drops pretty, pretty fast. Like we went from an 80 degree day to a, maybe, you know, by the end of the night, it was a 55 degree night or something like that, you know, below 60, it's not cold, but, but a significant drop in temperature and things were getting, uh, yeah, I was noticing like between songs, I was wiping condensation off my drums and our keyboard player, Susie was just like her, her gut instinct. She's like, you know, this keyboard's getting really wet. She's like, I'm wiping it down in between every song. And she says, I think it's the keyboard causing the ground fall. I was like, mm. okay. So, you know, without, without spending a whole lot of time just discussing why or how or what, you know, we just went with her gut, turned off the keyboard. We had a second keyboard on stage that, that uh, Hedwig would use occasionally. And it was like, okay, you go over there and do that. I'll pick up Susie's harmonies. Like, no problem. We like go. And we made it through the rest of the show. No problem. It was weird. So presumably like the evidence supports that it was the keyboard causing this problem. Now, I mean, it's a keyboard that's plugged in via a transformer, an AC to DC transformer. I like I would assume that the trans, I, I don't know everything about electricity, but I, I was raised doing a lot with electricity and also had, you know, two double E's in the two electrical engineers in the house. So, um, I, it like, it doesn't make sense to me on the surface that the, the, any problem, any condensation that was happening on the, on the circuit board inside the keyboard would have been causing this, but certainly unplugging it, you know, got us through the gig. So it's like, well, we don't, we, we may not know what the answer was, but, uh, right. but that, and it may be that like, I mean, obviously there's something I could, I just don't know. And that's possible, but it just seemed weird. Like none of us could explain why that was the case. And yet the evidence certainly supported it. So thank goodness we, you know, Susie, you know, she was like, ah, th- let's trust my gut on this. It's like, okay. Like <laughs> we've tried everything else. <laughs> like, yep. So like the, the trust in your gut in those scenarios is, is helpful. Um, you know, she knew she's like, I can hear it when I play it. Like, I think something's weird. Like, okay. Okay. It's weird though, man. <laughs> you ever had anything like that happen where the power just keeps, well, you and I did. Maybe it's me. Yeah. Remember when um, we played that gig? The power kept dying. 
Where was that? Some racetrack or something. Oh, when you were out with me that weekend. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I remembered that. Um, yeah, that was, that was a weird one that, you know, and that was a, it was an old bandstand, an old, you know, at a, at a, at a county fairgrounds. That's what it was. And, yeah. um, and literally it was just ghosts in the, in the electricity and just a, a race to reconfigure how much stuff we were putting on any one circuit. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That we were, we were blowing the circuit. It wasn't just a ground issue. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's crazy, but it is one of those things where, you know, you get the team together and, and trust the gut of in the moment, whoever, you know, try experiment, try it. What's the harm? Especially after also, four times. You know, that, that, that kind of brings up like when something goes wrong, uh, we've had several occasions where power has blown once we started. And usually it's those ones where we don't get a sound check, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you don't really know what kind of load you're throwing, you know, uh, until you hit those first chords. I can remember, you know, four or five times where, and man, that's a, that is a naked feeling, right? Uh, you know, where you're, you know, you just are realizing that you're not hearing stuff on stage and, yeah. and, uh, or you're realizing that the audience isn't hearing what you think they're hearing and, and, uh, you know, what do you do? And, you know, we've had times where we try to keep playing and get the audience to sing along, hoping that, you know, a switch will be thrown, we'll get back in and it'll just be a, a, a shared funny moment for everybody. Yep. But, um, and we also had times where we're just dead in the water, you know, while things get, get figured out. So, but you know, that's, uh, nobody, I don't know that any fan will ever remember those things. They still only remember the good that you did for them. That's true. For them. Yeah. Yeah. In the moment, it's a panic thing, but the best thing you can do is, is roll, like, accept that it's happening. I mean, if it's obvious, well, okay, you know, don't ignore it, but, but you're right. You know, panicking. What, what was it that, that, um, that, that, uh, Brad Maddox, when he, when we had him on the show, he said somebody early in his career gave him a piece of advice that stuck with him and it was don't run towards a fire. Right. It, you know, and it, and it definitely was that the other night. It was like, everybody remain calm. It's like, okay, we have a problem. Everybody in the room knows we have a problem. Like, this is not one that, that only one person knows about. <laughs> but that anxiety is contagious, right? If, if totally. you panic, if the band starts cursing at each other, yeah. the whole vibe of the show turns into that. And you don't want that. You don't want that. No. And and it was a song. Because that, it doesn't solve anything. It definitely, you know, it doesn't doesn't make it get solved any faster. Everybody wants it solved fast. You know, yep. all in your tech career all in your band so yeah no, right yeah. it's all all same team that's right yep but whoever's fault it is if it's anybody's fault and in that scenario no. probs not but you know doesn't matter it's like yeah th like let's just get through it thankfully it was uh, not thankfully I mean, we had good performers throughout but um uh, Alyssa was singing that tune and and she's you know like as with as with many of these folks is a real pro on stage and so she just she st actually stayed in character uh, and, but yet, you know, was just like moaning about, oh, you know, this is what happens and, and here we go. And she started telling jokes and this, that, and the other thing and like made it a funny thing, which was, you know, I mean, what else are you going to do? Well, I guess you described it. You could start yelling at each other and make it really weird for everybody, or you can just kind of roll with it. Yeah. 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 Always be performing even when the power goes out. Even when the power goes out. Yeah. So then, um, Saturday night I had two two back-to-back -back shows, the same, it, 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 a different venue from Friday, of course, but, but at the same venue, we played a six o'clock and an eight o'clock with bitter pill, man. I love playing with that band. Everybody can play. Everybody can listen. Everybody knows how to perform. Uh, is the music challenging? Yes. Uh, I mean, some of it is and it, it, at different levels. Yes. And some of it is, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't know, funky bluegrass kind of stuff. I don't know. It's, it's, um, rhythm and bluegrass, I guess is how, how uh -huh. Billy describes it. But it's, it's, um, Billy, it's my friend, Billy Butler, who, you know, sort of pulled this, this band together and, and has written most of the songs, although his daughter, Emily is also a singer in the band and she's written actually quite a few of the songs that we play too. And, um, Billy plays, uh, Billy's normally a keyboard player and is a fantastic keyboard player. He is now in bitter pill. He plays cello as a, a bass, uh, which is an interesting. Yeah, I know. And like, you know, he's been playing it for two years. His bowing technique now is getting great. He mostly he's, he's picking it or plucking it. I he started say. from scratch on cello and is now chops are up to performing 
His chops level. have been up to performing for, you know, since about two weeks after he started playing. He's, he's one two of years. These, yeah. He's one of these people uh, that can just play. I know it's great. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and he's singing while he's doing this, like, you know, yeah, no issues. And, um, so, but you know, there's some tunes that are like, we played, we, uh, we played some, you know, like Celtic real type stuff. We played some straight ahead bluegrass. We played some one drop reggae. We, you know, it's sort of all over the place, but the band can stretch out when at, at the right times. I mean, some songs are tight little, you know, three minute numbers that, that with nice little harmonies and, and they work out great. And it's a little two beat thing on the drums or whatever. And it's great. And then others are where we stretch out like crazy and everybody really gets to play. And, and yeah, mm. so the material, yeah, I, I get to play, uh, have to play um, more in this band. And at times, you know, more aggressively kind of driving things, not aggressively like playing like, like a metal band or something like that, but, you know, really driving the groove and things like that um, have to happen in, in this band. I love it. It really, it's a fun band to play with. It stretches cool. kind of all sides. We play some jazz numbers, you know, it, it's all over the place uh, there. You know, I was playing brushes at points and, um, you know, but, uh, so the, Billy is the, is the, is the leader of this band? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he sings a lot in this band. He sings most of the, yeah. He, I mean, he and Emily split the vocals, I would say 50, 50. Uh, and so this is like interesting music, interesting musicians. It's not your typical cover band approach to the world. Uh, how does he book it? Uh, as an original band. I mean, we play some covers, like the one cover that anybody might have known that we played is a, a Tom Waits tune called Get Behind the Mule, which is a song that we I mean, we sort of play it like Tom and then we stretch it out into our own thing, which I guess is what Tom Waits would have done anyway or would does anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, like some of the covers that we play are like old, uh, you know, field songs and things like this that, that you know, we played Cab Calloway. Oh, we played Minnie the Moochers. So like people might know that one, you know. Like, but uh, now I'll ask you again. So you yeah. book it as an original band, but where do you book yeah. an original band of that style of music? Oh, all over the place. Like it, original music is, is fairly easy to book in these parts. Um, it, especially in Portsmouth, people are very eager to hear. That's cool. Yeah. There's, there's, there's always been a good original scene in Portsmouth. And I should say there's like, it, it might not be where it used to be. Like when I was growing up, uh, all throughout New England, original music was very, very well supported. I mean, you'd make way more money as an original band than as a cover band, like, like without question. Yeah, 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 yeah. That concept is entirely foreign to me, right? Yeah. Although I think where I've moved now, I still haven't figured it out. So, you know, up where I was had a very vibrant cover scene. Yeah. I don't. And th so my frame of reference is that is always through those glasses. Sure. I think. I think here it might, it might be more original music. I'm yeah. not sure, but, but um, yeah. I'm trying to figure it out, but there's not nowhere to go to listen to. Well, I was you just going to say, you, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're sort of, yeah, you, you, things are a little muffled right now. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, there's, there's a good original vibe. And I mean, like I said, both of these shows, well, let me put it this way. It, certainly with social distancing and, and creating an outdoor environment with tables that doesn't normally exist limits your seating options. But both of these shows sold out before my wife even thought to buy tickets. So, mm. yeah, she wasn't like even up until five minutes after the show started, we weren't sure if she was going to be able to see the show. And then the people there were really cool to her and like sort of created cool. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. But you know, uh, this kind of leads me to a question. Do you, you have another story you want to tell about this gig? On Saturday? I, I wanted to. Yeah, I want to talk about the value of preparation, but go ahead and ask the question. I can I can come back to that. Yeah. No, no, no. I want you to finish because I think okay. we're, I'm going to take us out in the left field for a little bit. Okay, that's fine. No, so, you know, it had been a while since I had played with Bitter Pill. I was supposed to play with them uh, three days after my uh, surprise gallbladder surgery. And I was re like, if it was five days after my surgery, I really think I could have done the gig. But even three days after I was on the fence until, you know, late the day before. And I called Bill and I'm like, I can't do it, man. You know, and he's like, what are you talking about? Of course you can't do it. He's like, we knew you weren't playing the gig. Like, he's like, it's okay. You know, like, yeah, but I really want to. And it had been a while cause you know, COVID and all that stuff. And so I, 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 I asked the band if we could rehearse and a few of us got together a week before and rehearsed on Billy's porch um, just to, you know, just to reacclimate me to the tunes and, and talk through them and then play through them a little bit. I just brought a snare drum and stuff, which was fine. 
And, and that was good. And then Saturday morning, I sat down and went through each of the tunes. I have, you know, recordings of each of them, either that we've released on, on records or, you know, that we have from like demo sessions or whatever. So I have recordings of most, not everything. And, uh, and just, you know, made notes for myself, like, okay, this is the song. Like, if I look at the title of a song, do I immediately know how it goes? No. Okay. Write some note that describes to myself how, which song this is. Okay, great. You know, and then is there, are there any breaks in the tune? What's the groove that I play if it's not immediately evident to me? And how does it end? Right. So basically real quick. And I probably spent an hour going through these tunes that took us, that was probably an hour and a half's worth of music. You know, it was a quick path through, but, but I took my path through and man, like I didn't have to do it. I could have, you know, especially with the prep that I had had the weekend before I could have just shown up and played the gig. Tomer, our acoustic guitar player who also uh, does some Shakespeare readings in the middle of our show, which is cool. Uh, he, he's my, like, he's got my back all night. So he will cue me for breaks and endings and things like that, you know, cause he knows like I wasn't there. And, uh, and, and so I could have just relied a hundred percent on him and it would have been okay, but I thought, you know, no, this would be good. And man, it made the gig so much better for me. Just, I mean, I'm sure also for everybody around me, but being selfish for a minute, it made like, it made the gig so much more enjoyable for me to have spent that hour in the morning. So I was playing songs that I was, I had some confidence going in and I know a lot of these songs, but there's, you know, a handful of them that, that are, you know, either I played literally for the first time with the band on stage that night or, you know, are things that I, you know, I don't have a lot of familiarity with and just making those notes and kind of having that there, it made a huge difference in the enjoyment level of the gig. And as I was playing, I was thinking, you know, this is something that it's easy to lose sight of, you know, at least from my standpoint. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you folks that listen and kind of have a similar thought process of, ah, I know these tunes, like I, I can get through the gig and it's like, well, yes, but now I can get through the gig with some confidence and some enjoyment and, you, you know, make it put on the show that we are a, a cohesive band when in many ways we are, but in some ways, you know, especially for some of the songs, like literally the first time we played it, like we finished this one reel that Mike, our banjo player had written. And he's like, dude, that sounds great with drums. I'm like, yeah, I don't think we've ever done that before with drums. And he's like, no, he's like, but you hit all the stops and everything. I'm like, well, yeah. Cause I, I sat at home and I charted it out, mm. it, you know, like that, it, it, it's, it, it, it made everybody enjoy it, including the crowd. So that just that, that, you know, that little bit of extra prep time, um, that, that an empty nest affords me, uh, is not a bad thing. So no, I totally hear you. Yeah. I, I, I before we get into your tangent, I want to take like 30 seconds. It was very bizarre getting to the gig. I, I said to everybody and everybody's had been COVID tested at some degree, but I said to everybody, Hey, look, if anybody doesn't uh, you know, feels like either you haven't been tested recently enough and aren't able to get tested, you know, ahead of the gig, or if you've been, you know, at work or whatever around people and you want to be tested, I'll bring some of those, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I have some, some, uh, rapid tests that I bought. Uh, I'll bring them to the gig. We can, you know, we can just test you. Right. And so there were two people in the band that, that wanted to be tested as we loaded in and that was totally fine by me. I'm happy to, you know, donate those tests to the cause or contribute those tests to the cause. And obviously they came back negative. Everything was fine. Like nobody expected them to be positive, but it's nice to have the assurance. And um, so that was weird. And I posted a little something about on Facebook about it. And I had a lot of people local to me and around here, testing is super easy to get. And I had a lot of people local to me, including some who are like in the medical profession say, wait, you know, where are you able to get tested around here? And I thought I should take a minute and talk through, uh, the fact that testing is is fairly available nationwide here in the U.S. It's not easy everywhere. And I think that's why a lot of people assume it's not easy anywhere. But uh, I'm going to put two links in the show notes. One is to uh, Project Baseline, which is the thing that I think Google is funding. Uh, they're in 15 states. You don't have to be tested in the state you live in. If you live near the border of a state that has testing facilities, you can just go across the border. There's, like, they don't, they're okay with it. And Project Baseline is totally built to do this surveillance testing where it's, you know, asymptomatic people just making sure that you don't have it and that sort of thing. And then if you, you don't qualify for Project Baseline because of your location, I've got another link in the show notes 
that's for finding your local testing options. It sort of pulls together most, if not all of the options in any given area. You put your zip code in and it'll. That's great. Yeah. So those are in the show notes for you and your bandmates and your families and everybody like just know that this stuff might be more readily available than you think. And I'm, I, this is the, this is the most politics you'll hear out of me, but I really feel like, like the more all of us can get tested, that is our path through this. And I want to get through this. So right now that's the technology we have. So there you go. Yeah. And then the, the American president just recently announced that he's going to send 150 million of the Abbott quick test yeah. things out to the States. I don't know how they're going to be distributed once they get to the States, but yeah. you know, testing is the thing. I mean, it, uh, the vaccine stuff is an evolving story that to me is still kind of confusing as to where it is and where it's going. Well, it doesn't exist many- yet. That right. to me, that's like, I would prefer a tricorder from Star Trek to a vaccine that we don't have either <laughs> yet. So for now testing and let me know when either one of those comes around, like it's fine. Right. Yeah. That's kind of how I look at it. Like yeah. but t- testing is, you know, to be able to walk up and show a test and say, I had this two days ago. Here I am. Yeah. You know, yeah. Where have you been for the last two days? But but for stuff like making sure everybody in your band is cool, that would be, and you know, it, there's it, there's testing plus a little bit of trust, and that gets you pretty far away to confidence. That's that's what it is. Is it it starts with trust, but just because you and I trust each other, Paul, doesn't mean that I know you don't have COVID. Like you don't even know. Like, I mean, I like right. you might know, but 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 we haven't had the conversation about where you've been and what you've been doing. So I, you know, you can't know. And we've heard from enough of you out there that have relied solely on trust and had it bite you that that's Mm -hmm. where my policy of testing came from was, was from listening to all of you. And so I figured, wait, I I need to give this back. Like this needs to come full circle here. Yeah. 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 So, all right. All right, dude, I want to, I want to lay an idea on you and and just kind of give a reaction. Have you ever taken a gig literally backing a guy, like a guy was an entertainer or a band and um, he put together literally a group of musicians to do what he says. Yeah, I've I've done this uh, uh, a few times, both uh, w- both with a guy and a girl uh, or a woman. Right, and you know, what, yeah. was it was it original music or was it cover music? Um, original music in all cases. Yeah, yeah. so I want to just flip that a little bit. I just want to talk okay. about the I premise. Think, I mean, we I, we joke around a lot about the rock and roll fake book and, you know, yeah. the, the no, the no miss dance songs, you know, the stuff that will keep your band working in most cases. And that's because there's, um, it is a, it is a, it's kind of a can't miss formula. If you, if you play these cover songs that have already been tested by time yeah. and you play, and you play them well, you know, you have a product that you can go out and sell. Right. I want to ask you about the premise for creating something where a guy says, you know what? I look at entertainment a little bit more holistically. Entertainment is more about a connection between an audience and me. I want to get them to trust me, but I don't want to play the same cover songs that everybody pays. There's a lot of great songs out there that will work, but they're not familiar. And the, and the missing leap there between the well-known and the sellability, you know, I'm, I'm going to connect those two things by being a great entertainer, by being engaging in an audience, by being interesting to watch on stage, by putting together a band that is interesting to watch on stage. Yep. Can you envision that being successful or has it been tried and tested and doesn't work? Well, I mean, you know, as you asked me this question, the first things that came to mind were uh, scenarios, mostly in Austin, where I I joined or I was invited or passed the audition for, you know, in whatever pa- capacity to, you know, became part of the the backup band for a person who had written a slew of songs and wanted to go out. And And to be fair, Bitter Pill is you know, sort of like that, although every band evolves as it, you know, as the membership stays the same. But I would also say that, you know, like the first band that I joined here in New Hampshire, the, the not what was called knockoff where Kelly pulled it all together and it was uh, all covers, but it was her band and she put together the set list and all of that. And even with Uptown Celebration with Gary, you know, it's very much like we just do what he says, uh, you know, and then, and, and so, like, like, yes, I, I think there is merit in this idea. Now, the question is, why are we playing, you know, what's the, how are you going to sell this band that's only playing covers, you know, and yet not playing the ones that people would expect to hear? Yeah. So here's my thought. And again, I, this is a, a little bit of a, 
a, a self-realization ex- sure. exercise, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So A, do you have a reputation that, you know, can be a little bit of a proof of reputation yep. to open at least the door to get it booked? So you who's going to start the band and who's going to, you know, be the feature. Sure. Um, you have to, you either have to come up with some really fun video demo that kind of demonstrates the proof of concept and that entertainment um, uh, superiority mm-hmm. needs to be quite, quite apparent, you know, or you have to have, you know, personal relationships where people trust you that, you know, you will do something good. Sure. And then, you know, of course the end of this is you have to deliver the goods. It has to be really good. I think there's a lot of bumps to it though, because I think it's um, um, like when you join the, the first band in New Hampshire and it wasn't the same old covers, does it go in your mind? Like, am I going to make a commitment and invest in this thing? And I don't know, I've, I've seen this before and it's, you know, I, I don't think it's going to work or, you know, how did, how did you, what did you decide to take that gig? Cause you know, for me, when I started the house rockers and it was my first band after not playing for many years. And when I had played, you know, it was all the high school radio rock stuff that I was playing when, you know, it was back yeah, then. Right. Of course. Yeah. So come back into it. I'm like, Oh God, this music, you know, everybody would love this music if it was performed really well. And what I found was, um, musicians, even very good musicians, um, unless they're really the pro 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 musicians who will sell anything that they're playing yeah, and never, you never, you never see them sweat. I know in the semi-professional bands and you know, the ones that I've seen, if the dance floor isn't happening the way it's supposed to, you can almost feel on stage a little bit of butt tightening. You can almost feel yep. like, uh Oh, do we not have it tonight type of thing? So, yep. so to be that you have to get some music, you have to, you have to be a charismatic leader. In addition to a charismatic entertainer, you have to get your musicians to buy into a vision and help sell the vision. Absolutely. Pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. There's a guy up where I used to live who, you know, started a band, named it after himself. Um, you know, he, um, uh, he didn't get it done on a regular basis. He was playing, you know, his selection of covers were, were challenging. I don't think his band and his band was constantly changing. So, you know, there was not a constant vibe there, but you know, there's a business model in, you know, just getting pickup musicians to play behind you and you just have a book ready. But, but you know, it just was always felt disjointed to me when I would go see this guy in that um, his band was different degrees of tight um, and uh, you know, not willing to take risks confused when he wanted them to follow him when he broke, you know, stretched the song or, you know, went into some rap with the audience or something like that. And, you know, but that's, that's who this guy wanted to be and continues to want to be, but I just don't think it ever really gets to that fully realized vision. Um, And I think that the missing, because he's a good singer. uh, The missing part is um, I don't think he gets enough buy-in and then you can see he feels self-conscious that what's going on in stage is, exposing him a little bit and then you can kind of feel a little bit of uh uh you know concern coming off the stage so it sounds like he's the wrong leader for that kind of band and i say that because i've like the the knockoff band was definitely that kind of band right so to answer your question what made me decide to join it i put out a post on craigslist when i got here and i don't even think there was a new hampshire craigslist 15 years ago like i I think there was the the massachusetts craigslist or maybe a boston one but anyway whatever it was i put one out there and i got lots of emails you know which was great and one of them rose to the top very quickly because Bill, the then guitar player in the band, uh, put in the subject of the email, you know, like four dollar signs, gigs booked, ready to go, need drummer. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. like, OK, great. Like he got what I was after. I was not interested in starting a new band at that point. I had just moved. You know, I was willing to rehearse a little bit to get up to speed. But then I just wanted to like go like start the gig machine. And so it was like, okay, great, perfect. And, uh, and so it was, the band was mostly like Bill was our guitar player and, uh, and sang harmonies and a few leads throughout the night. Kelly was our, our chief singer and, and truly our front person. And she really could work a crowd. You know, she had the Mm. right look. She knew what to do. Even if things were falling apart on stage, she was still like holding it together. She was, she was the glue in that sense and really kept everybody together for the most part. Right. 
uh, our bass player changed out occasionally. And then, and then as that got to be a little too fluid, our drummer also started changing out occasionally for the gigs that I didn't want to do with the bass players. I didn't like playing with, but it was fine because no one, there was no commitment in this band. Um, it was just a band, you know, it was Kelly's band and she would, if she asked you to do the gig and you said, yes, then, then there was a commitment there. You know, you, you would, you wouldn't show up to find another drummer at the gig and she expected you to be at the gig. But you know, if, if, if she, if you had something else and she said, can you play then Saturday night? No. Okay. No problem. I'll find another drummer. Like, you know, that's how that band was. And it was great mm -hmm. from that standpoint. It was great. It did like, from my perspective, there was one lineup of that band that did incredibly well. And then there were other lineups that were like, okay, but in terms of entertaining the crowd, everybody that she got could play. Everybody that she got basically knew the tunes, uh, the, the way she wanted you to know them. And, uh, and could perform and entertain, you know, the same crowd two nights in a row. Most people probably wouldn't have noticed the difference between. Um, How big was the band? Four pieces, guitar, bass, drums, and then Kelly on vocals. So it was basically a, a trio of musicians of, of music, a trio of instrumentalists, all of whom sang, but you know. And were any of the, uh, the other players constant, like every gig they were with her? So, I mean, Bill, the guitar player was for sure. And then the bass player and I were, you know, were the, the, I was with her for a long time. And like I said, and then the bass player thing got so fluid. There were a couple of bass players that I just didn't like playing with. And I was like, wait, why mm -hmm. am I, why am I not home with my kids tonight? If I, if I'm getting to this gig and literally setting up so I don't hear the bass player all night, like that, that was not a good thing. And I even told Kelly that I'm like, I, I just don't like playing with this guy. And she's like, that's fine. She's like, so you don't want me to call you on gigs where I, I have to book him. I'm like, yeah, if you, if, if, you know, call me mm -hmm. as the last resort, not as the first resort. And she's like, that's fine. Yeah. And, and for the most part, you know, I remained first call for, all the other gigs. So it would, like, it didn't burn me, even though it totally could have, you know, right. for obvious reasons. Yeah. And I knew that going in, you know, but, um, but yeah, it can work. And we did some weird covers. I mean, we did some straight ahead stuff that, that you would expect, but it was a female fronted classic rock band. She would sing a lot of tunes, the, you know, that were, you know, what we would call guy parts that were like originally sung by a guy. So we were doing some, you know, we were doing some Doobie brothers. We were doing grand funk. We were doing, uh, you know, Chili Peppers, Stevie Wonder, like things like that. Um, and it worked out fine. Um, so, but, but it was different. It was like, I have never played in a band that had that set list. It was a little heavier, a little darker. I want to say is what the set list mm -hmm. would have been. It wasn't like the happy go lucky, you sure. know, cover tunes that, that everybody, the great American songbook, everybody knows and loves. This was more like the. You'd find this in a, you know, a dive bar, maybe a biker bar kind of thing with a little no, bit darker. It. Yeah. So, so to, you take it to the next lane. Did, was the fan base, her, they were into her, like, did people follow her around? Correct. Yeah. They knew, they knew Kelly. And I mean, look, my friends would come out and see the band too. Like that, but, but yeah, the, the sort of the, the, the fan base. The rep of the will. band. Yeah. Yes. It was her. Absolutely. And there was no question as to it's, it's the Kelly show. You, you know, the, why didn't she name it that? I don't, I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I, it wasn't my decision. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I get it. Just, you know, I'm just fascinated by all the parts of it. You know, we had a good conversation uh, the last couple of weeks about, you know, is COVID a time where the slate gets, gets clean yeah. and the reemergence of live music will come out in a different way. Will duos, you know, rule the world, you know, for a while. Will acoustic singer songwriters rule the world, you know, until, you know, multiple people can, you know, pack into places. What will live music be like? And, you know, I, I always think about, um, you know, like everybody who plays music, you think about what would put the smile on someone's face who came to see you. And I, I kind of think about, you know, dancing and being fun is playing dance music and just creating a happy vibe. Like you said, not dark music is, is certainly one tried and true path to that, that continues, has continued to work. Right. Right. But the question is, are there, you know, and I'd love to hear from any listeners who this is their situation. Are there people who are just great entertainers that have put together a show of cover music that the lead person, uh, you know, basically this is a methodically constructed show where the audience interaction is very purposeful and thoughtful and thought through and, um, and the stage show is thoughtful and thought and thought through. And it doesn't, it doesn't depend on, uh, fake book, 
material, right? Yeah. The rock and roll fake book material. I would really be interested in hearing from audiences that do that. And because when I look at, you know, our friends over at Cover Band Central, Cover Band Confidential, whenever they do these exercises, a post your set list. Yeah. I you still see, you know, what, 70%, 80% are playing you know, kind of similar pools of music to choose from. There'll, yeah. be, there'll be occasional what we have referred to as vanity songs, deep dives into something that the band gets a kick out of. But the tried and true stuff from a lot of working bands is the stuff that gets them to work. You know, the 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 bar owner or the theater owner, if you're booking cover music, you know, that's that's kind of the promise that these guys making. It's like, you like, have fun. I like looking at those lists because you can tell the ones that are like, okay, this band plays biker bars. Like, you, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, Oh, okay. Perfect. Like the blues band that I was in, in, in Texas, like we played like most nights, it was probably 20% originals, 80% covers there there, you know, it would move that needle would move occasionally, but by and large, that's what it was. And, you know, we would, we would fit our originals into a set of covers most of the time. That's, that's sort of how that worked. But, you know, we were a cover band, but we weren't, we weren't playing the Doobie Brothers. We weren't playing, you know, well, Bruno Mars didn't exist back then, or at least not, yeah. not in that way. But you know, we weren't playing those tunes, but we were playing like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Hendrix and, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And that like, like you don't, I don't see bands around here playing that kind of stuff. At least I can't mm. find them. I would love to, because I lo yeah. like the trio format is absolutely my favorite. Um, there's, you know, I, I've said that on the show, but I mean, I look, don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, I just said how much I love playing with bitter pill. That's a six piece band. Everybody gets along. It's totally fine. It's great. But the trio format almost guarantees that there aren't clicks happening. You know, everybody's on the same page. There's plenty of room to play. You know, everybody's, everybody can like dig in and everybody drives the bus. And, and, uh, I don't know. I like, I like the trio format, so I'd love to find a blues rock trio again someday. That would be, yeah. Be I, fun. yeah. If you're listening out there, tell us about your bands. I mean, it, yeah. it's interesting material for us. Like I said, I'm looking to find, you know, videos of, uh, and what bands around the world, are based around just a really great performer who owns the show and he's so good. He can play whatever he wants because he's going to, he's going to yeah. entertain people. He's going right? to entertain. Yeah. That's I mean, what knockoff I've, was you know, with Kelly for sure. Yeah. We have, um, fly me to the moon in our, in our book. Right. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, my horn players who play in big bands, you know, that's, that's second nature to them stuff. But, you know, I think that would be an incredibly clever thing to pull out at one of these festival gigs, you know, just something unexpected. It's so classic. It's, you know, just beautiful. We and play it, we play it every great. gig with Uptown. See, and, and I wouldn't play it as a nostalgic thing. I would play it as a surprise. Yep. Do you understand the subtle difference between those totally. two? Totally. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't play it tongue in cheek. No, you know? no, no. We play it like we mean it. We play it like there we wrote go. the song. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are very few things. I mean, there's sometimes where it's 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 good to play something tongue in cheek, but that's not how we a, a, a approach that song at all. No, it's like we mean it when we play it, and that's and if really we cool. play it too fast or you know if the groove's not right, we beat ourselves up about it. Absolutely, cool. Right? Yeah. That's a hard song to get right, especially when your mind before and after is is you know in like September. And, and mama don't dance, right? Like, <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's hard to get that mindset and that groove to, to like, to, you know, to change your gears. It's, it, but it, but that's the point of it in, in our set is to change the gears and to, to be this thing. Mm -hmm. that, yep. People know, but don't expect. Yeah, exactly. But it's hard to, it's hard to play it right now. Yeah, it's fun. So yeah, come on people out there. Tell us about your bands. Tell us about, you know, what makes you unique, you know, tell us about interesting adventures you guys have and, you know, music selection. I, I would love it, Dave, if we can get back to talking about songs. I always find those conversations, you know, like yeah. really, you know, you'll mention a song every once in a while. And I'll just remember the first time I heard it, first time I played it, first time someone got it, you know, and especially those deep dive songs. I mean, you know, the, the songs that, maybe start out as your vanity songs, but because the band pulls them off so well, they become part of your, part of your they vibe. Be become part of your vibe. Yeah. We, um, yeah. we, as we were having this conversation, I had forgotten in the Kelly band that I call it the Kelly band. It was called knockoff. Um, but in the, in the Kelly band, we, we played feeling all right, but we played grand funk railroads version of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard that version. It's like, I have. It, yeah, it, I mean, it is, 
big. It's big. Yeah. But it, it like it moves and then it, it, it breathes and like it was so much fun to play. But, you know, it was the kind of thing when she put it on the list, it was like, wow, I'd never heard it before. You know, when I first played it, whatever, 15 years ago. And, and but the nice part was I to your question, I know we're wrapping up here, but your question of like, do you trust the, that this is going to work? I, it never dawned on me that I shouldn't trust that it was going to work. Y y you know, like she, she put it on the list. She's like, learn the grand funk version. It was like, fine. Like, I don't know that. So I sought it out, which was much more difficult back then. Cause you know, even Napster wasn't as, as you know, plentiful, but anyway, I found a version of it and was like, Oh, this is not the feeling. All right. I knew, you know, this is mm -hmm. nothing to do with Joe Cocker or Dave Mason or traffic or whatever. And, and, uh, but, you know, it's like, oh, this is cool. And I was I, like, I looked forward to playing it for that reason. And it worked like people loved awesome. it when we did it. But it but it could eat like if we played that at a wedding in Uptown, it would probably fall flat. Like people would be like, what the mm. heck are you guys? What did you guys do to this song? Like we want to we want to boogie. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. but that's actually part of the equation I'm talking about is like, yeah, you um that is your show, you right. know, the, 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 those grand funk railroad, you know, rarities and you get hired to play the wedding for that. So it has to work or, you know, or they made a bad decision to hire you. I'm yeah. interested because, <laughs> yes. because the immediate reaction to what you just said is yes. You know, if you're a good versatile band, you have the right repertoire for wherever you're hired. Yeah. Those types of things. I'm thinking about it the other way. I'm thinking about it. Like I'm going to package up a show of music, two hours of, of interesting entertainment based around cover music. Um, and you know it's it's you know I it's going to be danceable music, but it's not going to be known music, right? And again, right. if you use dance, if you use dancing as the metric, I guess I guess you don't always have to do that. Um, but you know, I I'm talking about someone who says, "Here's our plan. Uh, it, it's all about entertainment. It's not about." can't miss songs um, and we'll take some risks, but you know, we're going to kind of put together this show and sell this show and people are going to love it because we're so darn good at it. So how, so how often does that happen? I have a name for your band, but you can't use it because it's already been used, but you've spent like, I, I love that you're, you're thinking this way, but, but I, I also can't help but, but think back to uh, you know, all those conversations where <laughs> the phrase, you know, you haven't seen my fastball yet comes out, yes. right? <laughs> and so you should name this band fastball, but you can't because taken, it, yeah. it's already taken, but that would be the, the sort of, you know, inside baseball, no pun intended uh, version of this band's name. Like, you know, so you're Genius. putting, you're putting together your own fastball, which I think is great. I think it's awesome. I like the idea. <laughs> I just couldn't help but, you know, tie it all together. So. Well done, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody likes fastball, I saw that they are doing a uh, drive-in concert in Austin. I don't think it's going to be streamed, though, so I think you'd have to go to Austin to see it. But uh, I wish I lived closer to Austin. I or just play it. The Way a couple times today. I love that tune. It's a great it's song. It's a good tune. Yeah. yeah. I, have the, uh, I have the lyrics for Out of My Head uh, on my wall at home, uh, handwritten by Tony Scalzo which is that's kind of cool. cool. Yeah. Our friend Bob actually gifted that to me a few years back. So, um, not so left sets, back. not left sets. No, Do Bob, Dr. <laughs> Mac. Uh, so yeah, a great Bob, a great Bob, yet another great Bob. That's right. Yep. All right, folks. Well, that's what we got. Yeah. Find us at, uh, at feedback at gig .com. We would definitely like to hear from you. Like Paul said, you know, tell us about your band. Tell us about your set list. And, uh, and, you know, we'll tell you what we think and like, but you know, it's all about like making us, I don't know, a giving all of us something to do and something to focus on and B you know, honing our craft even further. So we'd love it. We'd love it. That's all I got, man. It's cool. time to go. Yeah. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Always be performing. Always. Even when you're playing Grand Funk's version of Feeling Alright. I love that song. Special. That's what I'm going to go listen to. So I'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs>